Hi, I am Ria Jaram, N2RJ, and today we are going to talk about DXing with modern software-defined radios. I am an SDR enthusiast, having gotten my first SDR sometime back in 2002 in the form of a kit, and my upgrading to a Flex Radio 6700 in 2016. I am a community Elmer on the Flex Radio forums, and I've been an alpha tester with Flex Radio, and I've also been using a lot of other SDRs and trying them out, and I generally have interest in the space. Professionally, I'm a systems and software engineer, and I work on a lot of sophisticated systems. So with that, let's go on to our talk. So a word on radios. As I mentioned before, I am a Flex Radio user, so a lot of my talk is going to be using my flex radios. However, a lot of these techniques can be applied to any software-defined radio, at least most of the modern ones. So don't worry if, if something seems unfamiliar. You can always ask questions at the end. We'll have a time to answer questions. So if you have something specific you'd like answered, let me know. This talk is not sponsored by any SDR or radio manufacturer. However, we do say thank you to all the sponsors of the QSO today virtual ham expo without them this would not be possible okay what I love about DXing why do I love DXing I have enjoyed DXing ever since I was a child even before I became a ham the appeal of receiving distant signals and making contact with faraway places has always appealed to me my dad was a shortwave listener back in the 1980s, and we listened to the BBC, The Voice of America, All India Radio, and several other distant radio stations. Back in the 90s, I got my first amateur radio license, and I was influenced by none other than Mr. Tony Limak, 9 Yankee 4 Alpha Lima. He was a very big influence on me. He always taught me a lot of the technical side of amateur radio, and he always taught me about being curious. And being curious has helped me a lot in my technical career and also in amateur radio. In my journey in DXing, I've learned a lot about my station, about propagation, and about the world. I have never known that so, there are so many countries and islands and places in general and how varied they were. I've made many friends too. DXing, if you're not a DXer, if you have not tried DXing, maybe you should give it a go. So DXing pushes your limits. It's kind of hard for a beginner to imagine that you'd ever work a hundred countries. I was that way once. I had antenna restrictions, so I did most of my operating mobile with an ICOM 77000. Um, and I had it in the car and we used to go by the water because um, it's easier to, to work DX that way and work our DX that way. And then beyond that, I reached 200, 300 countries, and past 300 is where it began getting difficult because then I was mainly chasing D expeditions. Getting on honor roll, I'm not there yet. I'm kind of close. I'm not really that close, but I'm getting there. You have to have time, dedication, and skill. You'll take every advantage you can get. Of course, you must stay in the rules, but today's tools do make it easier. It can also be rewarding. You can get these pretty plaques to put on your wall. Who doesn't want these on their wall? Here you have my DXCC 5-band DXCC, DXCC Challenge, and previously you saw my mixed DXCC certificate. I've done DXCC on 9 bands from 160 through 10 meters, and I'm working on DXCC on 6 meters. And um, it's been quite a uh, rewarding experience. Okay, so here are some factors when chasing DX. You have to know when the DX is there. You have to know what DX is there. You have to have the ability to hear, the ability to be heard, the ability to stand out, and the ability to know where the DX is listening, if they have some pattern, because you know most DX works split. They don't really work simplex because split is the most effective way to handle the DX pileups. So you'd have the DX listening on one frequency and then a range of frequencies 
Um, they'll be transmitting on one frequency and then listening on a range of frequencies. They might go up like this, or they might go ping pong, or they might just go random, or they might just go watering hole, sit here a little bit, work DX, sit here, work a little DX, and then go up. You're going to figure that out. And it's much easier when you have the tools to see what they're doing. So we talk about the tools. Uh, the tools we're talking about is a software-defined radio. The SDR landscape has changed so much since the first SDR was built. The first SDR actually was developed for the U.S. military as a means to consolidate radios. But in amateur radio, we've known SDRs for, I would say, a little over um, 18, 20 years now. And they started out kind of like, you know, as an experiment. You had an article in QEX by Gerald Youngblood, and then later on everybody began experimenting, and you have the high-performance software-defined radios, and, you know, everybody just got on the bandwagon. Within the last few years, with the success of some of the, um, the other radio manufacturers, Flex Radio, ICOM, and others, you see everybody figuring out, hey, you know, this SDR thing might not be so bad. Or maybe they had plans to do an SDR anyway, and I didn't know about it. But anyway, SDR manufacturers, traditional radio manufacturers, have gone SDR. And that is not a bad thing. Because that means you have more choice and you have more competition. So the tipping point has been reached, really. SDR is now mainstream. So what does an SDR offer? It offers you visibility. You can see the spectrum. You can see what's there. Performance. You can get the best performance and the best performance to price ratio in an SDR. Integration. You, everything can talk to everything. So your radio these days is not just by itself, but it must talk to things. And then you have presence, what I like to refer to as presence. You need to be there. You need to be in the chair to work DX, except today you don't have to be in your shack. You can be anywhere in the world. And we're going to talk about it. So visibility. How do you see the DX? So this is pretty straightforward. I mean, every pretty much modern SDR comes with a pan adapter display. You have a display showing the current, not only the current frequency and what's on the current bands, but you're also seeing what is on the other parts of the band as well. And um, that can be wide or it can be narrow and focused so you could see in detail what's nearby. Here we have a picture of a 160 meter contest where I was observing. I think I made some contacts in that as well. But you'll see this band full of CW signals in on 160 meters. And that's the kind of visibility you get. I mean, basic level of visibility. There is more. What about if you decode the signals? Well, here we have CW skimmer. We have the ability to feed a wide signal into a CW Morse code decoder, known as CW skimmer. And you're able to see a lot of the... Um, decoded signals. Now you can do this with a conventional radio, but you're restricted probably to 3 kilohertz of bandwidth because that's what most conventional radios will have. You'll get the audio bandpass. With an SDR you get the whole RF bandpass, you get the whole band and probably even more. And um, they actually, I think you can get up to 192 kilohertz on CW skimmer um, available. And then some SDR manufacturers have gone as far as to make it available in their software where you can overlay this data and then you can put the data on the screen, overlay it onto the frequency. Now you can actually get that decoding either from CW Skimmer or from an external source. But it's most effective of course when you do it with CW Skimmer because you're actually seeing locally decoded data. What about tomorrow? Well, you know, speech recognition, probably even this video, you feed this into YouTube or some other um, video platform and they can automatically transcribe and create captions. I do some video production, so I um, see captions and then I decode those captions. I, I look at the captions, close caption, and I just make minor edits and I'm good to go. So maybe a future skimmer can do voice. So here's a practical application. Here we have a pileup, and you can actually see live how 
each of the signals are interacting there. And then you can also see the little blinking five nines, five nine nines on CW. That's where a station has worked the DX. And then from there you can ascertain a pattern. You can see if they're either moving down or up, or you can see if they're just staying in one place and listening. Very revealing what's going on here. So let's talk about the performance. When you place signals in the analog domain, they're adversely affected by factors in your environment. Our environment, our electrically noisy environment. When signals are in the digital domain, they're isolated from those environmental factors. Therefore, you will find that things like the noise floor is better in SDR, dynamic range is good, with a, with a caveat, I must say. And with direct sampling SDRs, you'll find that there's less reliance on analog mixers, so that means there's less phase noise. If you look on the diagram to the right, you'll see a, a description of what phase noise is. So a word about measuring performance. A lot of people tend to look at receiver performance testing and um, you know they, they use that as a metric. It is a very valid metric, but you have to be careful what you're looking at. So here I have the, the chart with Rob Sherwood's test results. And he tests the receiver performance. Now Rob has also been um, emphasizing transmitter performance lately because he's noticed that a lot of radios have very dirty signals on the bands and um, that, that is a, a, a bone of contention as well. But here you can see the results show that a lot of the top performers are in fact software defined radios. And that's no accident because these radios don't have signals, noise in the analog domain to deal with. They don't have a lot of the limitations in um, traditional analog um, super heterodyne radios, so they're not limited. And you'll find that some of these radios are surprisingly affordable as well. But if you look at the chart, you'll see at the top the FTDX101D. You'll have the, the earlier Flex Radio 6700. You'll see an ICOM receiver. You'll see the Elecraft K3S, which actually has SDR internals um, in one part of it. You also have the um, another, well, another version of the Elecraft ICOM you have Kenwood, and then you have Hilberling PT-8000A, which is a super heterodyne radio. Um, it's about $18,000. It's handcrafted in Germany, so if that's your thing. But it's, um, it's basically the limit of what you can reach with a super regular super heterodyne radio. And um, so that list is pretty much dominated by software-defined radios. Now, the metric he uses is the, um, the narrow space dynamic range, which basically means the ability for it to work a crowded band. And by a crowded band, I mean where you have weak signals interspersed between very strong ones. So you have signals that um, from the big guns and then you have the little pistols in between and you want to work them all, right? You want to work the DX. So th this is how they um, they tend to, to rank them. And um, You'll find that AWRL also uses a similar metric. They, AWRL developed something called RMDR, which is something called reciprocal mixing dynamic range, which is basically the same principle. You're looking for something to work crowded band conditions. And here you can see the, um, a result for an Apache Labs Anon 100D, and typically how they, they measure, um, how the AWRL lab measures a receiver. You can check it out if you're an AWRL member. You can go back and look in the archives of QST. They have product reviews and such like that. If you're not an AWRL member, now might be a good time to join. Okay, so there is a caveat with dynamic range. So the, if you notice, if you've ever done anything with any digital signals, you'll find that once you reach the top, you've reached the top. You cannot go any further. So think of a digital signal as having an iron ceiling, whereas an analog signal has a rubber ceiling. So you could kind of like push a little bit up there and, you know, stress the limits of components and might say, okay, yeah, you go a little bit up there. Well, on digital, nope, you reach up here, you're done. Because, you know, digital has discrete values from zero to whatever number, 
high number you have um, and then um, you're not able to go any further so this this is why digital tends to to, to max out you'll notice on ICOM radios they do provide an, an overflow indicator which indicates when the analog to digital converter is reaching saturation some other radios don't have that but you'll still notice the effects anyway you might see some weird stuff on the pan adapter and this is most pertinent when operating close in together conditions for example field day or multi-operator contesting but in general though if you're using radios close together it's good to to solve your interstation interference problems and there is a book that I will link below and, and, and show you what um, you can do and um, you know to prevent um, interstation interference it's out of the scope of this talk but I thought I'd mention it anyway where it's very good guide and so generally you, you'll have like filters and stubs and you know generally physical separation too although that's that can be overcome with filters all right so next we're going to talk about integration because the shack today is connected so integration and the connected shack so today's ham shack is not just a radio and a paper logbook although some people's shacks are a, 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 a radio and a paper logbook today's ham shack is centered around the computer and the radio and it's not just for digital modes it's for logging contesting automation remote control and other things like that a lot of this can be blamed on the rise of WSJT but things were trending in that direction anyway so you use your, your typical logging software like DXLog or N1MM and you know um, Log4OM, uh, Ham Radio Deluxe and, and the others and they provide control of your of your, your entire station. The software defined radios actually make this a lot easier because most of them are very well connected. Okay, so why does integration matter for DXing? Time is your enemy. Time is really your enemy when you're a DXer. The earlier you are in the pileup, the greater your chance of you snagging that DX and getting it into your log. As soon as DX gets on a cluster, it's bedlam and you don't stand a chance if you're a small station. I mean, that's just the, just the way it is. But um, when you have a well integrated station, if you see that DX on the cluster, um, maybe you could just go click the cluster spot and then get into your DXing software tunes a radio, you call and maybe you get it in a few calls. Or if you have CW skimmer set up, you can and feeds the spots into your logging software, you will have that available and you catch it before the world catches it over the internet. So um, really, really essential for today's DXing. Integration means less cabling. And less cabling is good because less cabling means less clutter. Not just for appearance, but also um, on your own sanity, but also for reliability. A lot of radios today, software-defined radios like the ICOM 7300, 7610, they come with USB. And um, that works well. That can connect to a single computer, and then that computer can, can network. Other radios, the, uh, the Flex radios and the, even the 7610 have an Ethernet port. An Ethernet port allows you control over a local network or over the Internet, which is an increasing way people use their radios. And with that, we come, we talk about presence, where the world is your shack. So no human can be everywhere at once. I know we wish we all did. But, um, you know, my life doesn't revolve around amateur radio, believe it or not. I have family and other commitments, and I have things that I do. You know, I'm a normal person who has a job and family and, you know, other commitments. I still manage to work DX. I still manage to catch the rare ones and fill up the logbooks, have the pretty plaques on the wall. How can this be? Well... <coughs> You have remote operation. You have your own station, set it up, and you're able to um, you're able to connect to your home station no matter where you are. And here I have an example of my station on an iPad. 
So you have your iPad connected to using the Flex Radio software and it connects directly to the radio. The radio outputs the pan adapter, audio data and everything. And then you're able to go and um, operate that from anywhere in the world. I was in Buenos Aires, Argentina when I actually took this picture and um, it was very nice to use my own station. The thing about an SDR is that when these signals are natively in the digital domain, it's a lot easier to push them around. And here I have actually my radio on my iPhone. You can actually see the pan adapter and the waterfall and everything. I can access this from anywhere in the world as long as I have an internet connection, either Wi-Fi or cellular. Okay. You can, of course, do this with a conventional radio, but it kind of, it's a little clunky. You probably need a special boxes and other software and such, and it, it's more difficult to do. Um, Mike Walker, VA3MW, is doing a talk on those, so he will explain in more detail about that. So let's talk about more tools of the trade. You have CW Skimmer, like I mentioned. So CW Skimmer is a software by Alex VE3NEA. It, um, it is able to take an input from an SDR or even an audio from a regular radio and then it will decode that wide bandwidth on CW and then it will present call signs of stations. It will also decode 599 so you can see where the DX is being worked. He also has RIDI skimmer for RIDI signals. Um, there's nothing for FT8, but actually you can do that with the FT8 software, so it's not a problem. You can also use Whisper for propagation analysis, and um, Whisper is, uh, there are little SDR um, dongles and kits that, that run Whisper exclusively, and um, one trick I, I learned from K3LR at Tamcom in Texas, he said, you run Whisper on your station a week before a contest, and you know when the band opens and closes, and you use that as your guide. Well, I use that for DXing too, so it's, it's, it's effective. If you want um, uh, crude but effective propagation monitoring, you can also use FT8. You turn on WSJTX and then see um, all where you've listened to and what time. You can use a site called pskreporter.info and PSK Reporter will tell you exactly what you've heard over um, some time. So what can you get for a dollar? Nothing. What can you get for $21? You can get a functional SDR receiver for $21. Softrock is a granddaddy of cheap SDRs. I cut my teeth on the SDR Softrock kits. They were 10 bucks at the time. I bought a few of them. I soldered them up. I hooked them up to my sound card. I hooked them up, hooked them up to antennas, applied 12 volts power, and boom, I was on the air with SDRs. I actually use another software from Alex called Rocky and Rocky actually was paired to work with these soft rock radios and you would be surprised at the actual performance of these. These actually convert the RF signals down to baseband audio to be decoded by your sound card. Um, you know, and you can use these for CW skimmer believe it or not. You have some commercial solutions too. They're based on what you call RTL SDR. So RTL SDR was a um, discovery by some amateurs that you can use European TV tuner sound cards, TV tuner cards as SDR radios. And that kind of worked out real well because these things were cheap. So, and then a lot of companies began building custom kits where you had the SDRs um, using the SDR RTL SDR chipset and they market them for CW skimmer use. Of course, you do need a down converter to convert to HF, but these have them built in. Um, here you can see one example called DX Patrol. So SDRs have been connected to the internet in more ways than one. You have here the reverse beacon network. The reverse beacon network takes CW using CW skimmer and then puts that out on the internet where you have um, a whole wide bandwidth of CW being received and then decoded. And then you can see actually if you search a call sign, 
you can see where you're you're getting out if you search your call sign you can search where you're getting out who's receiving you and how many db that comes directly from cw skimmer <clears throat> you can do even further propagation analysis of your station i was actually quite surprised that in some respects i was louder than k3 willy willy um, Chas from Frankfurt Radio Club, one of the winningest contesters on the East Coast. Uh, if you look here, you can go to reversebeacon.net forward slash analysis and you can see, you can then plug in, um, you can then look for a, um, a, 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 a reverse beacon station and then you can um, go and plug in call signs and then with those call signs you can actually see who is you know com you plug in two or more call signs and you look to see who is louder at what time typically is best on a contest weekend above all when you're DXing you have to stay in within the rules you use your tools but you stay in the rules you can use local antennas and local receivers you can use remote receivers and transmitters at one location. So it means that if you're working a DX, you have to use a transmitter and receiver at that one location only. Um, of course, if you work another contact, you could use a transmitter and receiver anywhere within the DXCC entity, and it'll count for that DXCC entity. But you can't, for example, listen in Maine and transmit out of Florida. Um, that would be against the rules, so it's, it's not good to do that. 